free to use it uh, in any of your your potential teaching or in reflecting um, on the experience you have today. Because we got to go through this very very quickly in, in a matter of you know less than 45 minutes now. And so what we're going to do is just go through with some pointers about what you want to do to get your camera ready. Then what do you do? with the equipment that you have, the apps that are on the phone, the apps that you might buy that are free, um, to maximize uh, your ability to capture photographs, uh, video, and audio with your smartphone. And then we're going to go into uh, some deeper apps and some fun stuff. Yeah, some, some, some stuff. Some choice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We, we always now are separating. You got your stuff. Like yeah. last time we did this, it was like, is this one yours or is this one mine? So, I basically, just so you know, I have my complete production kit, including a tripod, shotgun microphone, um, and an extra battery right here. And this is usually always inside um, my messenger bag or my backpack. Uh, so I'm always running with it. Uh, when we get to doing some demonstrations, uh, Kyle and I will share connector and we'll be able to project what we're doing um, on the screen. Okay, so uh, let's get started. And um, if you have questions, throw them out. Uh, we'll try to do as much interactive stuff towards the end as possible. Uh, I see many of my many of our grad students, so you know where to find me. Um, we're here. Yeah, you know, this is our building. We're around here. So what do you want to do to really set your phone up? Well, you want to make sure that your battery is charged, you go into airplane mode, uh, keep uh, Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth off, background activities off, make sure that your camera lens uh, is clean. Use a microcloth cotton that doesn't have any starch in it to, to clean it because usually, um, especially with the students that we that we work with, <clears throat> it's just smudged beyond belief. It gives a very nice dreamlike quality. Yeah. Vanna will show you in the display. Um, all of the reasons that you want to um, do this is to maximize the CPU, the central processing unit, on your um, smartphone to be dedicated to capturing video. If we're doing stuff in the background, you can get glitches, you can get pops, you can get into uh, real problems. And you'll also run out of the, run out of your battery down very, very qu uh, quickly. Um, and again, uh, part of the prep should include testing sound and image before you start. What does that mean? It means you record 10, 15 seconds, and then you don't just record it, but you play it back. Just to make sure that you have audio and you have an image before you go anywhere. Um, one of the most important things that you can do to improve the quality of your image is to lock your focus and lock your exposure. If right now you take your cameras out just to test this and you aim it up at the screen here tilt it up to the ceiling, point it to the ground, and watch what happens, you'll see that the image will do two things. It'll lighten and darken to compensate for the exposure, and it will also um, kind of breathe, trying to find focus. And that's, in, in making video, you don't want to draw attention to that. So the best thing you can do is to lock focus Lock exposure at the appropriate exposure that you want uh, and, and at the appropriate focusing distance that you want. This will then ultimately limit some of your movement or what you might include in the frame. So compositionally, you might not be able to do a pan from the screen, which is relatively bright, over to uh, the audience because that'll be too dark if this is exposed properly. So you may have to change what we call coverage. Instead of doing one shot, maybe you do 
a one shot here and another shot that's exposed differently, right? So um, we'll show you in a little bit how to do that rather than plugging and unplugging. Um, even with the, the app that comes with your cameras, you have the control somewhere to go into AE and AF, all right? Uh, there are apps, uh, and our, my preferred app, I know, I think, and, and Kyle's Filmic Pro. Yeah, I've been using that. And um, I'm now actually a beta tester for Fil Filmic Pro because I've complained to them a lot. <coughs> and so they said, okay, you want to be a beta tester? And I said, sure. And they said, oh, we got to go back and, and redo some stuff for the five and whatnot. So um, Filmic Pro allows you to lock exposure, lock focus, and also lock what you see there is AWB, automatic uh, white balance, so that the colors look, look, look right. Um, Filmic Pro at a more sophisticated level, you can create rack focuses, you can have three-point focus and hit go and it moves uh, your focus from one point to another on your cue. It's really pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Um, uh, for those who know what that last bullet uh, means, um, we, we are missing one of our critical controls for exposure and that's the f-stop or the aperture. Uh, on the lens itself, it's fixed. So that there are only two ways that we control exposure. How fast the shutter releases for each uh, frame in video or still, and the ISO. Uh, Filmic Pro allows you to lock one or the other or go manual. Um, so we'll talk maybe a little bit more, more about that, but it is, it is a limitation. Um, this is one of our biggest. Do you want to take this one over? Sure. Uh, well, let me point at some of the equipment as I talk about it, maybe. Uh, for one thing, <clears throat> when you're shooting with a smartphone, whether for yourself or if you have your students working on something for them, trust me, the students need this advice if they don't have any experience, is there's no weight to them, really. And for those of you who are production people know that a pro professional camera or even a DSLR has some weight to it. So your muscles are working against it, and that helps stabilize it. Even handheld, you can keep it more stable. But this has nothing. So even when you think it's stable, it's probably wavering or shaking a little bit, depending on whether you've had just enough or too much coffee. Um, so the first thing is you should at least have a tripod option. And we have a few with us. Uh, you know, And I'll just stick to the tripod thing today. But some are, for the moment, we get the other things they have, you know, uh, they're mountable, we'll put it that way. But this is a little tripod that comes with a lens set. Let me flip that around. And, well, this came with one of my lens sets, and it's just tabletop. It's pretty simple. There's a number of these out there, and I think Larry's probably getting out some right now, uh, that have basically this type of, uh, what would you call this? Clamp. Clamp. There's a great clamp. Technical jargon. Uh, it has a, a clamp on it that is either built in, or I see you're all the exact same thing I am. Yeah. You can buy one to just put on the tripod you already own. This is less than 15 bucks. Uh, so, first of all, you want to have that option so that you can rest your camera on something, get your hands away from it, and shoot. Second, though, maybe you don't have the option of you know, a tabletop or a desk or pile up a bunch of books, whatever. None of these things are going to be seen. It doesn't matter how janky your setup really is behind the scenes. Well, you can try to set the camera on something itself, or you can try to set yourself against something. We've got, you know, stabilizers. I think this means hands. Is that what? This looks like a little type of thing. Oh, that's a double. Your hand. Oh. Handles and stabilizers. I see. Okay, sorry. Um, but you can also use yourself at a wall, a desk, or a table. It's just going to allow you to get a more stable situation. Or, I do this all the time. If I'm shooting something, I find myself a wall to just lean against. Or, say you don't have those options. Two things to keep in mind, two very important things. One, this 
is less stable than this. Keep it close to your center of gravity. Out here, you don't realize until you watch that footage that you're wavering around. You think you're stable, but you, you may not be. And then, uh, besides keeping it close to your center of gravity, minimize your steps. This is a lot bouncier than you think it is once you watch the footage. And Larry and I always like to say, don't be afraid to hit Tai Chi with it. <laughs> and I'm serious. It is true. You know, don't, don't be embarrassed by what you're doing behind the camera. Um, and I've seen even professionals with their big shoulder mount practice a shot where they're doing something like that. And they're like, give me, give me two or three more times of walking through this. Yeah, I'd like to say, you know, naturally what folks will do is, let's say you want to go from here over to you guys, you basically walk with the camera. You know, you go like that, right? And it's going to go boy, boy, boy. But if you try to minimize steps and plan the image that you want to get, I can make that move without a single step. Also, you also you'll have the tendency to just pan mm -hmm. using your body as a pivot point. But in terms of motion, it is always better to move through space, you know, penetrate space rather than simply pan from a single point of view. It emphasizes perspective and three dimensionality. And these fact, don't look. I studied Tai Chi. I, I was, you know, early in my my career when I was teaching at Columbia University and starting my professional work. Um, I was not doing my own shooting, and the folks with whom I was doing camera work were among the best cinematographers uh, in New York and San Francisco. And their handheld stuff was just stunning. And I, I would watch how they moved. And, say, how do you do that? and one day I was going up to office very early in the morning and I saw a bunch of old people doing this. You know, and I just sat and watched for a while and then when I stopped I said, you know, like the mic, what, what's that? And they said, this is Tai Chi. And I said, I need to do that because that's how I can work the camera smoothly. And you learn that every single one of your joints is a gyroscope. It's a stable. And, you know, if you don't like Tai Chi, dance. And, That's all it is. <laughs> and uh, my background story is I didn't study Tai Chi. I watched my dad study it. But I never tried it. Uh, however, just to mention it, there is stabilization built into some of the newer phones. I don't love it. I don't know how Larry feels about it. Um, but I know that these, the programs, I'm not, I'm not thrilled with the in the digital stabilization. I'll put I it that use way. it because I'm, I now have familial uh, tremors, so I, I have to. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so you, it's something I, I would say. What I tell my students with that is they should experiment with it and try not to rely on it. Try to stabilize your camera, yourself, your you tripod, can. whatever, to the best that you can. So. Yep. Um, in moving, we talked a little bit, you know, the tendency is to move too quickly, to pan too quickly. So practice your breathing in, breathing out, calming yourselves down or with your students, get them to slow down um, and not use any camera as a vacuum cleaner that's sucking up dust balls. You know, oh, there's a shot. Oh, there's a shot. So the, the key is to just move a little more slowly than you might otherwise move with the camera. This is any camera. Um, or just go the opposite. Make it a swish pan real fast. Get from one place to another. So that in between a little too fast, it gets chattery. Uh, you, you like little staccato jumps on vertical lines. Um, you have a frame rate choice in many software uh, uh, systems um, in many apps. Uh, 30 frames a second or 60 frames a second is the 
video normal for uh, the United States. In Europe, it's either 25, which is the filmic, the film rate, or 50, which is the video high high speed video rate. If you want to make something look what we call more film like, where it has a little texture to it, a little different feel, doesn't feel quite as immediate as video does, feels more historic, uh, shoot at 24 frames a second uh, in the United States. Um, but if you lower your frame rate to 24 frames a second, motion will become potentially more chatter. And that's because you're recording a third fewer frames a second. So any movement will m move across frames more rapidly. Um, also, movement is a, a problem in very bright light because the camera has to use a high shutter speed to compensate for the bright light. And when you have a higher than normal shutter speed at whatever your frame rate is, it freezes all motion more distinctly, like in photography. But because it's a hard edge rather than a slight blurred edge on motion, you see the chatter a little bit more. And what I would say is, you know, if you aren't familiar with some of these terms, the breakdown when it comes to a smartphone that sometimes I tell my intro students is avoid at all costs way too much light or way too little. Even though you think it can handle it, it's kind of unlikely, especially as a beginner. And you know, you might see your point and shoot or your DSLR handle those situations, but there's reasons those can. There are limitations to this device, and if you work with them, you'll get a good result. If you push it, you might get some of these. Uh, and convent conventionally, we recommend, uh, especially if you're going to have students um, or yourselves, do something that has editing involved and is, you know, maybe a couple minutes, not a Vine, not an Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, shoot horizontally because that's the convention for high definition, 2K, 4K, etc. So, uh, you mentioned avoiding uh, using or having too much light or too little light. Are there apps that you can download that could uh, compensate for those situations? Because you might be in a situation where you can't really do anything about the light. I don't know if there is or the, the, the chips, um, the sensors on the cameras have limited ISO and no app can change that. And, and you know, so um, what you could do is if you have a lens adapter, oh, yeah. you can put a neutral density filter on the lens itself as we do with our, you know, camcorders. Um, but, you know, it, the bright light scenario, like outside in a bright day, is you still get an exposure. But at some point, if you aim up at the sun, you aim up at uh, bright clouds, they're going to burn out no matter what you do because of the limitations. And so you have to learn to compose and conceive a little bit differently. Um, but there is a case for vertical video. National Geographic a couple months ago made an announcement that all their producers had to produce uh, uh, material, media, for the social media, for their use in social media in a vertical domain. And that's because most people don't flip the camera and watch record and watch horizontally. They're in a vertical world, so we have to start preparing for that. And I, I don't mind that. I have it's, like, it's like, eh. you know, as you start in photography, you start in photography. I think we flip on uh, generational opinions on things. <laughs> You're like, I'm okay with the vertical video. I'm like, kids, don't do that crap. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, well, my attitude is you figure it out, you know, you guys figure out what works. Um, audio is the hardest thing to really do well in any production situation. Um, the camera, you know, you can frame out something that you don't want to see, but you can't do that with sound. You listen to the room here, we can't get rid of that home, no matter what we do. It's there. So. Getting control over sounds really important. Some things to think about. Turn off radios, turn off refrigerators, um, if and when you can. Uh, I, early in my career, I did turn off a refrigerator, and it cost me about $300 because I had to restock the refrigerator. I didn't turn it back on when I left, 
and it came out of my pocket, not out of production, because it was my responsibility. Uh, so ever since, what I do now is that if I turn something off, that's where I usually leave my car keys or my smart card, you know, my, my commuter card. So I can't leave unless I Yeah, leave. the car key trick is standard for production, but based upon experience I had two summers ago, note about that, make sure the person who put their car keys in there is one of the people who drove to set. So I had an oh, actor call point. me because he got to his apartment, dropped off, realized he was the guy who put his car keys in the Oops. refrigerator. And he's like, can you pick, oh, come pick me up? God, I never would, have th never would have thought about that. No. <laughs> okay, so, so um, also, when you have your cameras and if you're interviewing and talking with someone, the tendency is to kind of be in a conversationally appropriate space for whatever culture you're in, right? We have, I, don't, I don't want to be over there filming. You know, this is where we have to get to talk, right? But that's not going to work as well uh, for your audio. You don't want to put, you know, so. If I want to get decent sound in a relatively quiet place with the onboard mic, I need to be about here. I need to be two, three feet away, max. Which means that my frame is going to be more of a close-up than a medium shot, right? But I need to do that to get good audio. There's always in documentary an issue of what, what does directing in documentary mean? Um, I've been doing this a very long time, and if I find someone who normally talks, you know, loudly enough to hear, but because the camera uh, intimidates him or her a little bit, or microphone, and they get quiet, I will request that they speak up over the noise, because I need I need to get good audio. Right? Also, sometimes think about separating image from sound. And just put the microphone here and get great audio and think creatively about what the, vis the, the visuals are. So use two phones. Yeah. Have someone else run a phone with an audio, or with or without an audio app, you could just run the video recorder and shoot a shoot, shoot down or and listen, whatever. There, and there are tons of uh, inexpensive to expensive microphones that become directional, they're called shotgun microphones. So this is one, it's battery operated. I can, you know, I have a little rig that I, I use. Uh, I would, well, I don't have an iPhone 5 anymore, you can use it, I think. All right. But um, uh, I can plug this in and it has a reach, if you will. It gets rid of noise to the sides. It has like a, a shadow of sound, so it's directional. And that's helpful. These can range from 50 bucks. This costs 200 dollars, um, but it, 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 it really works well. Further, one of the biggest problems with sound is that we can't uh, monitor sound. With some of the newer phones, you can actually go into the headphone jack with the microphone and then the headphones, so I can listen to the sound that I'm recording. This is this was five dollars uh, on Amazon. If you're interested, I'll uh, remember to uh, make a note of it in the um, Google Doc. It's on Blackboard. Um, with, with, it's a T T R S S something to T. I don't know. Yeah, so no. it's an adapter that works. Yeah. and there's adapters for near me. I've actually the last two shoots I did with my smartphone is I'm working on a documentary and using smartphones as we'll say almost the primary camera, uh, is I just bought, I bought an adapter to plug in a regular XLR mic. Yeah. So if you already have anything or access to something, there's a good chance there's an adapter you can get for it. And Google's your friend. And don't be afraid by the price tag of what's out there either, because I know Larry mentioned this is around 200, 250. Yeah, you got there. There are some options that, while not as good, because you're going to pay for quality, are an improvement on the phone itself. Yeah. Like, I, have, I don't have it with me, but I have a little tiny shotgun mm -hmm. that's, I think it was so a 30, 30, 30, 30, somewhere on that. At yeah. this point, prices are just... R-O-D-E is a good manufacturer. Road. It's a very good manufacturer. Um, wind in exterior situations is really, really tough. Um, you can try to put fleece over the base of the phone and knock down some of the wind noise. It sounds like... <laughs> 
uh, me clearing my throat when I'm waking up in the morning. Um, or um, they, some of the microphones come with uh, a soft one. Uh, this is called a dead cat. And it, it absorbs um, the energy of the wind and allows the sound waves to go through. So any external work uh, kind of demands some protection because anything more than five miles an hour wind or three miles an hour wind is going to hurt, hurt that a bit. Which is why, again, it's a good idea in whatever location you're in is to test the situation. See if your image and sound are working well. Use earphones to monitor your sound, not just the speakers. Okay? Let's, we should get through this fast. Um, I want to go through this, I think, just really, really fast because sure. we don't have time. Mm -hmm. um, there's some rules that are important, but they're not important enough to go into right now. The most important thing is to think about coverage and cutting cutting the world that you're, you're telling people about into pieces. So you want to have wide shots that show everything, but then you want to start moving around and finding pieces. What are the pieces of the puzzle? Because the only way that you can ever edit anything that you film is to have enough pieces to compress time. If all you do is shoot one big long single tape, it would be a pretty fancy film, but it would be essentially real time. Right? So you have to figure out a way what's important, what are the pieces, and then how to order them. Um, and that takes editing and it takes you know, thinking. But it's not that difficult. Linda.com is a great source. It's free to all of us. Um, uh, Linda.com has great, great uh, tutorials on iMovie, uh, Final Cut, Adobe Premiere. They probably have it on Windows uh, Media Maker or whatever. Um, we're Mac yeah, I have no idea what Windows uses but, these but days. But look to Linda with their tutorials. They give you files to edit and go along. And I, this is what I do, this is what we do with our graduate students, essentially. We, we say, first, expose yourselves to Final Cut or Adobe Premiere through Linda to get started. It's a great, great thing. And while I don't, and I, I think you're probably still on this bandwagon with me, you don't recommend editing on your phone. You know, I would have to say that recently, well, testing some things, I decided I should understand what the iMovie on the phone does. Yeah. And I was able to cut together some shots, but it's really best to get it out into a computer and yeah. edit there. Unless you're doing a Vine or a right. immediate Instagram, it's got to go out. Um, remember earlier I said that our world goes faster when we're filming, and the things speed up, so you need to slow down. When I'm filming, I, and I try to tell my students, um, Hold your shot. If you have a nice frame, nice composition, stay with it for at least 10 seconds. And so one thing that I'll do is to tell you how excruciatingly long 10 seconds is. My colleague, our colleague, uh, uh, Bill Gentile, right. says 15. Yeah, so I have, a, I have a shot here, right? I just started rolling. I'm settled. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004. I am really ready to do another shot. Seven. Eight. I'm dying here. I want to move the camera. Ten. That's a long time when things are happening. And you want to say, oh my God, I should have been over here. So, but unless you provide yourself as an editor with material, you will always be frustrated by not having enough to hold the shot. Reuse it. Um, and then if you have time, keep exploring. Um, one, one of the things that we do is that if I have a shot here, I don't do one move across or one shot. I will do 12. I'll say, oh, maybe I should start a little closer. Maybe I should not go over here at the end. I should land here instead. Maybe I should be a little farther away, a little lower. So I keep finding improvements to my first thought. So I explore, I work. Yeah, if I, I could, think that's about it. Can I throw one yeah, sure. shaky back on that? So in the context of the classroom, I'm assuming some of you or most of you are probably here, you know, thinking about how to use this in a course of what goes on students. That the advice right there I've noticed, working with students who are beginners, 
uh, stressing to them that you're no longer taking a photograph. They're used to taking a photograph, and maybe they do vines or you know short figures or whatever, but that's a different type of filmmaking when you're shooting yourself or you're shooting this thing that happens. When you're making coverage, if you're thinking like you do when you take a photo, you see it and then you move on. But in this case, you need to see it and hold it. You need to keep in mind that later you're going to want an extra second of it, an extra eight seconds of it. Or you're going to be like, I wish this wasn't only three seconds long. I so wish, and if anyone's done a video, they've been in that situation. So the holding it for 10 seconds is really something that stretches them. And the multiple shots, I actually will structure an assignment where they have to edit three shots together for a final project. Here's what you're delivering me, the three shot thing, just to get your feet wet. But you're also delivering me five versions of each of those shots. So there has to be 15 shots along with that final version to get them used to do it over and over again. And if it was a more advanced situation, I would say 12, 15 shots of each or 10. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Like Larry said. But at least in the case of freshman and sophomore, like everything you plan, give me five times you do it so that I know you're getting that time and discipline and repetition in. So, so, so think, uh, I'm going to st stop the um, <coughs> report. Um, but what if, how come this is not working? There we go. Okay. Um, that's my grandson. He's a Batman and Leaf Blower fan. So he knew we were going to the lake last fall, and he said, I know exactly what I'm going to do. So he cracks me up. Um, what I wanted to do is to just show you how you uh, auto-lock um, the camera. So my lens is here, and we'll be seeing you momentarily. So these are my two favorite programs you can see here, Filmic Pro, and then above 645 Pro, that's for still photography. It affords amazing uh, flexibility and manual controls. Um, but I'm just going to stay with uh, the camera that comes with the iPhone. If you guys want to get out your, um, uh, uh, your material as well, um, here, I'll try to show you. See how, it, as I tilt down, it just popped, it got brighter, got brighter. And then if I move across, it chatters just a little bit. So it's better to try to hold. But let's say I, I wanted this to be both my focus point, this right here, my focus point, and my exposure setting. It makes you guys a little bit dark, but all that I have to do is to hold down with my finger until I get that pop on the, um, on the box. And it says up top, auto exposure, auto focus, lock. There's a little um, sun symbol here, right, by the box. That adjusts exposure. Whoops. See, I'm just sliding exposure up and down. So I can adjust within that. And now, no matter where I go, the exposure stays the same and the focus stays the same. And this is built right in. A lot of people don't know about this, actually. Yeah. And pick up their eyes so that's, that's all done. Um, as opposed to going like this, and then over here, see it goes up, goes down, changes white balance. Um, Oh, um, I, I think we're going to have time just to show like a little bit of, um, maybe, is your, is your rig set up? What do you um, I have just this uh, thing called an Olo clip, which is a, a clip-on. Here, since I have a really interesting telephoto. So this suddenly, yeah, so this is, this is a wide-angle adapter. If you notice, I now have actually the whole theater, almost from one end to the other. This is what I have with the onboard camera, much less. So I like these uh, adapters. They degrade the image at the edges a little bit, but they really, really work well. Um, some of them are very expensive. Some of them are not. And if you look on the uh, handout that we po that's posted online, all this equipment is in links. 
and yeah. after hopefully there'll be enough time for you at least to ask us questions. But what I have here is one of the only smartphone specific telephotos that I've been able to find. And most telephoto, hi there, let's see if I can get you in focus. That's sometimes an issue when I just get it out. There we go. This is an eight time telephoto. And the reason that it's uh, impressive compared to a lot of others that are built for smartphones, this is optical. So it's actually in the lens that I'm focusing. Um, so I think it's worth mentioning that there's, this is with cam kicks. Uh, Larry was just showing you the Allo clip, which I have one of those also. Um, you've got a few things here, like the B-script, which allows you to put lenses on it, uh, or the M-cam light, which is an aluminum rig with some weight that has its own design lenses, or you can get the DSLR adapter for it. Um, what I might ask before we go over yeah. Yeah. is um, I, I travel with this little battery thing from Anchor and KER, and it will power an iPhone or charge an iPhone two to four times depending on the flavor of the iPhone. So I can use this and I can keep filming pretty much over the course of the day. Um, this is a couple of years ago I got it for $37 on Amazon. That's a really good thing to have, especially if you plan on shooting in environments where you have limited time with your subject and they're going to get impatient if the phone just dies. Because sometimes you never know. Phones have their own personality. I've had mine die a lot quicker than I thought it would. I've also had mine go. I'm like, oh, I can't believe it still has a charge. Um, or if you're like out and you need footage in the woods, so it's nice to have a backup battery. So, thank you very much. Um, please follow up. Um, hopefully we can spare a couple minutes if you have any questions for us or if you want to get in touch, like I said, I, we, well, we both use this stuff in the classroom and we both visited a number of classes in the university, School of Communication and outside the School of Communication to help instruct students on how to shoot video better or how to use a uh, smartphone score because we've noticed a number of uh, classes are starting to try to use video and photo projects to complement work in other uh, fields of study. Yeah, and I'm doing a test or a pilot program with CTRL where I'm going to spend three one-hour blocks with faculty uh, to kind of go more in depth with this. And if we get enough uh, interest, then we'll both yeah, we'll help you do it. So if there's, if there's flyer, slack to be picked up, I'll pick flyer, it up. So this is this announces it. Where'd you get it? Oh, okay. Cool. Did y'all get one? Okay. So, um, and again, it's, the, the idea is that this is this can be valuable both for faculty research That's communication true. as well as student work in the classroom. And what uh, we, I have a. Uh, last, this is the first session when they did such a good job of scheduling me. I have the last session for my second piece, and it's about, it's about using visual communication for research um, and scholarship. And the, the argument is, is that teaching, you know, using media to, as text um, in the classroom provides an incredible opportunity for student learning in a new in a new era. So we, we meet kind of all the latest goals, certainly that we hear from our provost. Um, it's integrative learning, it's teamwork, it's problem solving, it's synthesizing, and it's research. It's multimodal uh, communication because the students have to write, shoot, edit, write again. Um, so it's, it, I'm finding pedagogically that it can be 